to have with us uh, Her Excellency, Madam Chandrika Kumantunga, who obviously needs no introduction to this audience, and His Excellency, Mr. Kassam uh, Utim, a member of Club of Madrid and the former president of Mauritius. So thank you very much, Your Excellencies, for being here with us today and for agreeing to uh, say, uh, to uh, actually um, chair a session uh, that is actually uh, being sponsored by the um, SAPRI, the South Asia Part uh, Policy Research Institute, uh, of which Madam Chandrika uh, Kumantunga is the chair. Uh, we also have a, uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Asoka Gunavardhana, who is the former chairman, Finance Commission of Sri Lanka, and, and who is also a director of the Center for Poverty Analysis, uh, who will be giving uh, the key um, keen, uh, the, setting the scene for this session and for the discussions. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Gunawardhana. We are very pleased that you can be with us today. Uh, SEPA is not very good at standing on ceremony, so I think we will, st uh, uh, we will go straight into the session. And I request Madame Kumar Tunga to uh, take over as the chair. Thank you, Madam. Good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, today's session is on governance and inclus shared societies or inclusive societies. We will not bore you too much uh, going into the concepts of it because we have uh, two experts on the subject. Uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Kasamu team uh, has chaired or co-chaired with me uh, a committee on shared societies at the Club of Madrid for several years. Uh, and we have done uh, quite a lot of work on this, conceptually and practically. Mr. Asoka Gunawardhana is a senior public servant uh, who has worked on uh, uh, shared responsibilities, devolution, and all that. Uh, in the Finance Commission under my presidency, but also outside. Um, so I shall just say a few words about the subject. Shared societies or inclusivity, inclusive development, uh, as we understand it and conceptualize it, is considered an essential factor of governance today. Uh, the present dialogue on the post-2015 development agenda, or SDGs as it's sometimes called, has focused on a hitherto neglected factor, that is the need for inclusivity when formulating and implementing development programs. The concept of shared societies and inclusive development is much talked of in international fora since about a decade. Shared or inclusive societies are those in which all citizens enjoy equal rights and have equitable share of the benefits of development with equal access to education and knowledge, health facilities, jobs, land, and other public assets. In inclusive societies, all citizens have equal political rights. We also envisage that an inclusive society is one in which the political, governmental, and societal structures are designed to allow an equitable distribution of and equal access to the benefits of development and prosperity for all, irrespective of the community to which they belong. Today, I think this whole symposium, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is about uh, the South Asian aspect of the post-2015 development agenda and what we would like included in it. And I think that's what we, you have been deliberating on for the last, well, yesterday and uh, for, for, the, for two days. Uh, we know that in our region, in South Asia, we have uh, taken giant strides forward in economic development. However, hundreds of millions of our citizens have been left behind, continuing to live under conditions of abject poverty, 
and are even becoming poorer than before. They remain marginalized, while the benefits of economic growth are enjoyed by a relatively small number of the privileged classes. The lack of equal opportunities for an ever-increasing number of people causes frustration and anger. They are no more willing to tolerate the inequalities. This invariably leads to violent political movements. Economic development happens to be only part of the solution. We need to adopt a holistic plan of action which will encompass the socio-political aspects of the problem. Also, all those communities which have been excluded historically or even in modern times for various reasons must be included as equal partners, having equal rights in the economic, social and political spheres. When formulating policies for development, an inclusive approach is required so that the benefits of growth reach the disadvantaged and that they are included in the implementation of the programs, in the decision making. We know that many countries that have adopted an inclusive approach have been able to smooth over uh, political problems, problems of protest, uh, even resolves civil conflict. Studies have shown that when all communities living within a state are guaranteed equal opportunities in every sphere and their separate identities are respected and given free expression, they will become a productive, vibrant part of the state, celebrating the richness of its diversity while building a united, strong and stable country. Such a society is what we call a cohesive, shared or inclusive society. I will not go into further detail. I think I'm, I'll be uh, robbing some points from the key speakers. Uh, I believe that uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Kasamu team is going to talk to us about uh, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and the post-2015 agenda, uh, shared societies within that. And uh, Mr. Asoka Gunavardhana will speak to us about uh, governance and inclusive development. Before I hand over to who talks first, uh, to Mr. Gunawar, then I would just like to mention one more word. I forgot. Governance, when I say governance, good governance, is an extremely essential part of uh, effective development. We have a lot of experience in our region of bad governance, which means inefficiency, corruption, nepotism, uh, unskilled people in power, and all this kind of thing, which has seriously damaged uh, the developmental process, its results, and its achievements. So good governance, I think, has to be an extremely important part of the SDG post-2015 agenda, and it is something we have to insist on, especially in our region. Uh, may I now invite Mr. Asoka Gunawardhana to give us some of his erudition. Thank you, Madam. Uh, uh, I am indeed uh, happy, pleased uh, to be associated with you once again after working together for eight long years uh, in, in the Finance Commission. And maybe uh, uh, reflecting on uh, some of the things that got done 
or did not get done, uh, uh, especially from the point of view of uh, governance. Uh, I do not intend go going uh, back and getting into a cr critique of the Sri Lankan experience. I will briefly refer to that, but by my uh, main purpose will be to look at uh, what we know about governance, uh, what the literature tells us about governance, and uh, uh, how we need to move forward uh, as far as uh, governance is uh, concerned in formulating an agenda on governance, especially uh, in the third world countries. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to uh, uh, position myself within the, the, uh, the symposium, the seminar, and uh, I have picked out what is more relevant to me and my presentation. Uh, the, the objective seemed uh, t talked about repositioning development pathways to one that is more sustainable, and I thought that I would make that the the context uh, for talking about governance and shared societies. Uh, uh, sustainable development would have been discussed exhaustively yesterday, and uh, I, am, I see many experts around the table, and I'm not an expert in sustainability, sustainable uh, environmental issues, sustainability arising from uh, uh, environmental considerations. But I would like to note uh, the classic definition uh, that, that we generally use uh, to mean what sustainable development is, namely being one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future gen generations to meet their own needs. Now, what does this involve? And that will be uh, what I will be talking about. It involves uh, mobilizing diverse cons constituencies to agree on a society's development goals and actions, extending from national to local, in fact, or, uh, uh, or, or local to national, if we consider subsidiarity to be the principle for organizing development actions. Human actions for sustainable development must be grounded on, lo on the local context where effects are experienced immediately or directly. Local actions are necessary to ensure that neither the market nor the state acts to endanger the environment in which people live. Then a necessary condition for good governance will be decentralized modes of decision making, which would enable a holistic rather than a sectoral approach in the management of resources for development. It is in this context that we will look at shared societies and governance as constitutive elements of a sustainable development pathway, exploring or attempting to explore what institutional imperatives contribute to a movement along a desired development tra trajectory. We are talking about a set of core principles uh, first, equity and universality in the transactions between citizens, legitimacy of actions through the rule of law, and we are talking about predictability of decisions, basically public decisions, through transparency, accountability, and participation. The good governance agenda uh, uh, argues for uh, a set of state capabilities or capabilities which must be located in the state if in order to practice, put into practice these core principles. First, 
political institutions that permit all citizens to influence state policy, universal provision of basic services, safety, security, and access to justice for all, honest and accountable governance that can ensure compliance and combat uh, corruption, as well as, not the least, nonviolent modes of conflict resolution. Uh, we will look at this in a little more detail later on. I thought, uh, uh, since uh, our concern is about development and about sustainable development, uh, that it would help us to uh, have a clearer understanding of what development is without going through how thinking on development evolved through uh, different emphasis on different aspects. Let me get to uh, uh, what is currently considered to be uh, uh, the, uh, the inclusive definition of development which focuses on people as a process of enlarging people's choices to live a long and healthy life, to be educated, to have resources needed for a decent standard of life and enjoy political freedom, guaranteed human rights, and personal self-respect. This is the definition of de development that was adopted by the, by the Human Development Agenda. Now, what I want to note the three very critical imperatives of such a definition of development is relevant uh, uh, from a governance point of view. First, the indivisibility of development, that all different aspects, economic, social, and political, are intrinsic to the concept of development. The need for all aspects to move together because the lagging behind of any aspect will cause disequilibrium in the process of change and improvement. Second, arising from the indivisibility of development is the inter interdependence of the individual and collective dimensions of development. Uh, we all know that collective action is essential for the less privileged attaining development as a freedom. Third, is the critical process of the role of the critical role of processes by which desired states of development are achieved and development outcomes are produced. Uh, I was going to uh, talk, a little, uh, uh, talk about shared societies. Madam has done that, and I don't need to. Uh, 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 I don't need to attempt uh, to to uh, 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 I don't need to attempt uh, to talk about shared societies, which was done so eloquently and so comprehensively by Madam. But there are uh, uh, certain features of a shared society which I want to note. Uh, which are important from a development point of view, from a sustainable development point of view, but more from a governance point of view. And let me turn to these uh, directly. First is that a shared society implies a sense of identity and belonging. People need to relate to each other. Second, a shared society Implicit in a shared society is a framework of values and principles uh, on which to promote trust, accord, and harmony to live as a society, as a nation. But also, more importantly, from uh, the perspective of governance, to underpin the formulation of the substance of social, economic, political, and cultural development. Third, empowerment, especially for the disadvantaged to exercise their rights and gain access to resources 
and participate actively in the process of shaping societies. Fourth, and finally, uh, fourth, uh, as far as this presentation is concerned, space, space for people to get together and work out their choices, their stakes, and their responsibilities. Increasingly, we talk about decentralization as the modality, governance modality, which would allow people to get together. But, and, and uh, uh, increasingly, countries are adopting decentralization to balance divisive forces and sustain the maintenance of an effective national state. Uh, what I would like to note at this stage is, however, there's potential for conflict of interest between local autonomy and national so solidarity, which a nation state needs to resolve, which must be resolved for a society to remain a shared one. I thought I'll briefly try and draw from the experience of Sri Lanka. And here too, uh, uh, I will not dwell on uh, the history of Sri Lankan development, but uh, note that when we look at Sri Lanka's development history, particularly when we look at the record of development attainments of Sri Lanka, there's one big important question that has to be answered, and that is conflict that has engulfed Sri Lanka from 1971 onwards. When we talk about conflict in Sri Lanka, we tend to talk about conflict from 83 onwards, but we forget that conflict started in Sri Lanka in 1971, and one needs to look at the reasons why there was conflict in the south and then conflict in the north. I will not get into uh, those, but note, uh, as I see, that the reasons for conflict uh, uh, must be sought in the lack of coherence in the practice of development fundamentals, and by development fundamentals, I refer to the three imperatives uh, that I referred to earlier, indivisibility, uh, interdependence of individual and collective uh, contexts, and the process. Uh, I, I want to note three uh, gaps uh, in the, the, the process uh, of Sri Lanka, which is relevant uh, to our, uh, our consideration of governance and, and the governance agenda. First, gaps between economic, social, and political change, which translated into a failure to create adequate opportunities for development, adequate opportunities for people, adequate opportunities for youth. The lack of coherence in the agency of the state, market, and society in the development pathway, where the redistributive welfare system and the centralizing market-based approaches were distancing people from the development processes. Third, discontinuity between individual and collective well-being, which was creating exclusive individual privileges rather than collective well-being, thereby failing to bring about equity between regions and communities. We are, that is Sri Lanka is on track to achieve most of the MDGs by 2015, or, uh, but we face the challenge of variations, significant variations at the regional level between different socioeconomic groups uh, uh, underscoring the need for inclusiveness. The challenge in the future is to share the fruits of peace, progress, and security more equitably. Let me uh, briefly turn to processes of development change before I get to looking at governance. And there are three aspects of change 
a development change that I want to note. Folk, uh, note. First, the changing nature of needs, expectations, and preferences as people move through, uh, move through different stages in the progressive realization of their desired states of well-being. Second is the progressive is the progressive realization, which is a dynamic process of development change, where needs, expectations, and preferences are constantly acquiring new dimensions defined in terms of rights and freedoms. Third is the nature of participation and accountability and the criteria of equity and social justice that take new meaning and require new formulation. There, this uh, takes our focus on the two aspects of development change that we need to look at. First, of course, is the set, uh, would be the sets of actions directed towards specific results and outcomes. But, but the second is what is more important for me as a set of institutional imperatives uh, to ensure that different development actions would move together in unison and guaranteeing that the desired states of development are achieved individually and collectively. Let's turn to governance. Uh, governance brings, brings together the state, the market, and society into a partnership, a partnership that requires regulation so as to ensure that development moves in the desired directions guaranteeing space for individual and collective choices, realization of capabilities and entitlements. Then there's a need to create and create mechanisms through which people articulate their interests, exercise their rights and obligations, and mediate the differences in responding to individual and collective problems and uh, collective problems in development. Now, Governance is a, is a much used and equally abused concept. And the abuse ar arises from the fact that, fact of its origin uh, and, the, and, uh, and how it came to take on its substance. Uh, the, the origins of the concept takes us back to the neoliberal antecedents uh, of, of the efforts to reduce the role of the state uh, and, and, and uh, uh, reduce the role of the state and viewing governance as narrowly as improving government effectiveness and provide a legal framework for market-based development. Then we pass through the phase of new institutional economics, where the role of institutions in working of the market system came to be the primary focus. Uh, we will look at this a little later. We have Douglas North, uh, who talked about uh, governance as the rules of the game and how they shape the development path. From there, we moved on to uh, with uh, the dis dis disillusionment coming out of particularly the, 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 the eff efforts to reduce the role of the state and shift to ma market-based uh, uh, approaches, the, the rethinking of the state, or what is referred to as bringing the state back in. We have the develop World Development Report of 1991, which had a chapter on rethinking of the state, and the report in 1997, which was titled State in a Changing World. It, it reflects the, think, the, the emergent thinking at that time of a changed role for the state in setting the rules of the game for economic and political life, giving substance to the good governance agenda. Governance is a neutral subject. And I don't want to go through uh, different def definitions. But basically say 
that it ad addresses the allocation and management of resources to respond to collective problems through institutions and processes that are transparent, accountable to the people, and allow them to participate in decisions that affect their lives. One of the problems of governance is that there's a long list of normative characteristics. Participatory, consensus-oriented, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, and follows the rule of law. Uh, creates problems as far as, or it, it, it makes for a multiplicity of approaches in defining the agenda of governance. Uh, we have at least three approaches to defining the agenda of governance. First is the reform of the role of the state. Uh, here uh, we have uh, the new management, new public management, NPM, uh, 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 propositions uh, for for making uh, for for, uh, cha uh, for changing the role of the state uh, uh, away from what was called rowing towards steering which became a key metaphor for what emerged as new public management later, basically to free the public sector from excessive political and hierarchical control that, had, that was considered to have stifled the market style and flexibility, uh, organizational efficiency and customer satisfaction. Then the, ne the a second approach, uh, uh, second definition of the uh, agenda of governance is what is referred to as governance beyond the state, departing from traditional forms of governance, which is through state hierarchies or uh, uh, through state, 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 uh, state hierarchies to a network of institutional arrangements which accords a much greater role in policy making to private economic actors on the one hand and civil society on the other. A third uh, approach defining the agenda of governance is what is referred to as cultural governance. Uh, interestingly, which is concerned with managing people and their conduct, which seeks to create or make out of citizens governable subjects, uh, emphasizing responsibilization which seeks to make citizens take responsibility for their own welfare. Now, this wide array of approaches, wide array of agendas uh, be become, make things complicated for us in developing countries. Uh, but before I turn to that, I want to look at where institutions come in, which is, which is part of the theme of, of, of my presentation, or the second part of the theme of my presentation, exploring institutional processes for change. Now, institutions underpin uh, how economic, social, and political institutions economic, social, and political interactions are structured and how decisions are made and resources are allocated. Uh, I, I'm sure we know uh, of the work of new institutional economics, which defines uh, institutions as rules of the game in a society, or more formally, as the humanly devised constraints that shape human that shape human interactions. What is important is then the, this definition of institutions uh, uh, 
becomes a way of reducing uncertainty in order to bring about a steady framework of economic relations and remedy market failures. New institu institutional economics was basically looking at the, the, uh, the re uh, what, what uh, uh, to look at uh, transactions, human transactions in the working of market systems or market economies. And the notion that institutions matter. The idea, the, the, the problem is that the idea of governance implies a wide range of institutional preconditions for its practice to prepare, uh, to produce desired results understood as good governance. It is also important at this, the, this stage to point out that new public management or the in institutional basis of new public management and governance beyond the state has in fact undermined the democratic basis of public administration, making inclusion or exclusion take place in non-transparent con and context-dependent ways. One final point about governance is are the, are the problems of its operationalization. Uh, prominent in governance, in, in the notion of governance, is the normative framework what ought to be which raises certain fundamental issues of giving, giving effect, effectuating governance in terms of what governance is, whether it is a means or an end, and therefore issues of causality, of cause and effect. Let me get to the final uh, part of my presentation. Uh, of trying to understand or, or, or trying to understand how we could strategize the relationship between governance and development, governance and a shared society, which, is which would be necessary if we are to reposition the development pathway in uh, developing countries. Because basically, the, 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 the e issue of governance as far as developing countries are concerned is, is that the concept is one that got developed in Western uh, uh, societies with uh, democratic <coughs> institutions and we are trying to apply th this concept in societies where we do not have those conditions. And, and, and therefore, we need to look at how we could strategize the relationship between governance and development. Uh, I want to very briefly note some of the uh, findings in uh, relation or, or, or findings arising out of a lit survey of literature on the linkage between governance and development which was done, which had been done by Governance and Social Development Resource Center uh, for DFID. Uh, it notes six uh, sets of findings. As Madam said at the outset, bad governance impacts negatively on the poor. So I don't need to go into that. There are several aspects of good governance that are intrinsically desirable. Political freedom is a key component of human capability following sin. Institutions matter for growth and for poverty reduction, but this is challenged on grounds of causality, conceptual vagueness, and whether all the important variables have been taken into account. The necessity to take a long-term view, because uh, 
filtering through of institutional change to society uh, takes time. The importance of demand side governance, especially uh, the results that have been achieved when citizens have been brought into the decision making process. And finally, the political sensitivities of governance reform, uh, uh, which uh, uh, governance, uh, effectiveness of governance re reforms depend upon the redistribution of power. Uh, the, the, the fundamental problems in op operationalizing a, go a good governance agenda, the long list of normative what ought to be is, the question of capacity to carry through such changes, and the uniqueness of the challenges to different country, sit uh, country situations uh, has, has, uh, has uh, uh, led to the, uh, the idea of good, go good enough governance, Professor Grindles, Grindles uh, which has been uh, su suggested on the basis that not all governance deficits need to be or can be dealt with at the same time, especially because institutional change is a process that is interlinked and must be strategically sequenced. Then repositioning of the development pathway requires to strategize the relationship between gov governance and development. <coughs> we already have the, glo the global thematic consultation on governance, uh, 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 looking at the concept and role of governance in post-2015 development framework. I'll not get too much into this as the next speaker will talk about MDG, SDGs beyond 2015, but what is important is that governance is, is not only a means, but it is also an end in itself. Now, it is important that uh, in strategizing the nexus between governance and development, we need to con contextualize governance vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis the country situation, particularly because the institutional values that are embodied in the framework of good governance stands in conflict with the cultural values of most developing countries. So there's the question of what interventions are strategic, what locations are optimal, where governance interventions would be located, and the sequencing of strategic uh, intervention. I shall uh, skip talking about de democratizing local governance. We have talked about that to some extent and get on to uh, leveraging institutions in strategizing the relationship between uh, governance and development or governance and shared societies. Uh, there are at least three approaches or perspectives for leveraging institutions uh, in strategizing governance uh, in development. First is from the perspective of the state in setting the structure of incentives that influence how the game is played. It refers to both formal rules and the effectiveness with which rules are enforced such that uh, these would uh, influence the structuring of behavior of relevant political, economic, and social actors. The question of credible commitments then becomes a critical factor in developing countries. We, we get into programs, but, but doesn't get backed up with commitments. The second perspective or second approach is the design of institutions that provide for deliberative space where people can effectively participate in and influence policies which directly impact their lives, what is referred to as empowered deliberative democracy. There are many examples, and the, the, the classic or the best example is one of uh, participatory budgeting from Porto Alley Group. I'm sure many of us uh, have heard of this. The third uh, approach or entry point uh, to leveraging institutions is external accountability. A 
accountability can take two forms. Uh, horizontal occurring internally within the state sector or within the public sector or vertical occurring externally. Uh, we are talking about various forms of social accountability which facilitates or which brings about a greater enhanced civic engagement in participation in public decision making, holding public officials accountable for particular decisions and behavior. Let me conclude with the final note that institutional change is complex and complicated. It must come to grips with existing uh, with, with existing value frameworks and, and, and to the extent that vested interests uh, have a tendency to preserve status quo, impeding institutional change, in, institutional change can be path dependent. I'll stop there. Uh, I think I concluded on time. I saw a guy, and, and I trust I didn't take uh, more than the time that was allotted to me. And I do hope that I was able to pull together uh, several uh, concepts and notions, uh, shared societies, development, governance and institutions. And I hope I was able to uh, bring, up, bring out uh, the various issues of uh, uh, getting, bring about the governance reforms and governance change. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Asoka. I think that was a very comprehensive presentation of the subject. Um, thank you again. Now I would like to invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Kasamu team to talk to us about MDGs, SDGs and <coughs> going beyond the post-20, going beyond uh, what? Uh, 2015. Uh, 2015. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Madam Kumaratunga, Mr. Gunavardeni, former Chairman, Finance Commission of Sri Lanka, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is always a pleasure to be in Colombo. I remember the first time I had contact with Colombo I was on my way to the Maldives for the presidential election, no, for the general elections that were to be held there. The elections that were not to be because the tsunami struck. I must confess I didn't know what tsunami was. And uh, when people around me said, it's tsunami, I said, oh, it's tsunami. There was no Japanese around to explain to me what tsunami was. And on my way back, because there was no election, the elections was postponed, I thought it would be postponed sine die, but it was held later on, one month after, and on my way back, I stayed a few days in Colombo. And later also, I had the opportunity of of, of coming back to Colombo and visiting uh, not only the city but uh, some of the southern part of the city. And I could see what a disaster it has been, this tsunami, and how people were living in abject poverty and in extreme difficulty. It made me like Colombo more than I thought I would. And this is why, when I received an invitation at the last minute, excuse my being impolite, madam, I was indeed invited at the last minute, but I made it a point to be present. Although I spent a whole night 
a whole sleepless night on the plane. I was telling you that yesterday. But as I said, it's always a pleasure to be in Colombo. And this time, to be offered the opportunity of participating in this very important symposium on the topical theme of the post-2015 development agenda. I wish to commend the organizers, in particular the Center for Poverty Analysis and its uh, dynamic executive director, Ms. Priyanti Fernando, on this initiative, which has brought together prestigious organizations and eminent scholars and stakeholders from countries of the region, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, the Club of Madrid through SAPRI and my respected colleague, former president of Sri Lanka, Mrs. Komaratunga. The Club of Madrid is highly privileged to be associated with this Southern Voice initiative and be able to participate in this critical discussion on the post-2015 development agenda. I shall uh, request you to bear with me as I, I will perforce have to, have to repeat some of the points made by the previous uh, speakers, in particular by Madame Komaratunga. The Club of Madrid, with its now more than 90 odd former heads of state and heads of government from every continent, has welcomed the decision to create a new set of sustainable development goals to follow on from the Millennium Development Goals. We believe that if we get the right set of sustainable development goals for the period beyond 2015, we would be on course for the next phase of our global story, which could save planet Earth from climate change and prevent the destruction of our environment. It could also hopefully lead to the elimination of absolute poverty and inequality, as well as the alleviation of the plight of the poor and the marginalized groups across the world. If we get it wrong, the prospects we leave to the future generations would be too dreadful to contemplate. Through its shared societies project, the Club of Madrid has been tracking the stages of the post-2015 process, as I know many of you here present have. For example, the report of the UN task team, realizing the future we want for all. The very use of the term for all in the title reflects our shared goal, that it should be for everyone. We have also taken cognizance of the report of the high-level panel of eminent persons set up by the UN Secretary General, the title of which summarizes its content. A new global partnership, eradicate poverty and transform economies through sustainable development. And finally, the report of the UN Secretary General to the General Assembly in September was quite comforting and encouraging. However, there is no guarantee that the positive elements in these reports will remain at the end of this process. It is, as you know, the member states of the UN that will, in the final analysis, decide what the new development agenda will be. And they are almost all widely influenced by their self-interest. It is therefore important that voices from the South be heard, supporting the progressive trends and ensuring that they do not get lost. India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, I understand, share one seat on the General Assembly's Open Working Group, which is the next step in the process of developing the new agenda. They could play a positive role in this working group, but they might also have to compromise on key issues. Therefore, 
the Southern Voices, the Southern Voices, should be prepared to address the UN system as a whole and should also engage with their national governments to ensure that their issues are not lost or overlooked. My presentation aimed at these SDGs, Shared Societies, and the post-2015 agenda is based essentially on the Club of Madrid position paper on this issue and a research project to assess the MDGs initiated by ATD Fourth World, an international anti-poverty movement of which I'm a member. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, one can read in the concept note of the present symposium circulated earlier that South Asia is home to the largest concentration of people living in debilitating poverty, conflict, and human misery. In spite of the widely held view that the MDGs have been significant in stimulating the progress made in this part of the world and elsewhere in Africa, in meeting the targets that were laid down in the year 2000, we note with some concern the continuing marginalization of many groups on grounds related to race, color, descent, language, religion, national or ethnic origin, and other markers of identity. I shall come to this in some detail at a later stage. The process of marginalization damages not only these groups, but also the society as a whole, socially, economically, and politically. It has thus hindered and impeded the full achievement of the MDGs, and we feel that if it is not addressed in the new set of sustainable development goals that are being formulated, it will have similar negative impact on their achievement and implementation. Moreover, the achievements of the MDGs have not benefited equally all people living in poverty and those experiencing the greatest hardships have been left behind. For instance, in Bangladesh, where microfinance has typically been showcased, NGOs have seen that nearly 20% of the people targeted did not actually benefit from such development programs. The UN Secretary General's high-level panel, of which, by the way, a Club de Madrid member, Horst Kohler, former president of Germany, is a member. This is the, the high-level panel of eminent persons on the, the post-2015 development agenda, in fact, observed that the MDGs did not, and I'm quoting, did not focus enough on reaching the very poorest and most excluded people. They were silent on the devastating effects of conflict and violence on development." End of quote. The high-level panel report also recognizes that the MDGs fell short by not integrating the economic, social, and environmental aspects of sustainable development. The result was that environment and development were never properly brought together. People and families in extreme poverty have already experienced the devastating consequences of a polluted environment and lack of clean water and sanitation, as they usually live in places prone to floods, landslides, and other natural disasters, or they work in extremely precarious conditions. Earlier this year, between the 22nd and the 27th of March, Meeting in Quito, Ecuador, the Inter-Parliamentary Union affirmed, I quote, growth alone is not the answer to the social, economic, and environmental challenges of our time. A different approach that focuses on well-being in all its dimensions is required if we are to evolve as a global community 
able to fulfill core human values of peace, solidarity, and harmony with nature. The perennial cycle of increasing consumption and production that is at the heart of the current economic model is no longer sustainable." End of quote. A new model should align development targets with human rights, norms, and standards. Such a development agenda would design cross-cutting goals aimed at progressively eliminating disparities within the most marginalized groups and between them and the general population, as well as between countries, in order to achieve more inclusive forms of development. In this regard, the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights adopted by the Human Rights Council on the 27th of September last year are very relevant. They provide global policy guidelines that can help policymakers ensure that public policies, including poverty eradication efforts, reach the poorest members of society, respect and uphold their rights, and take into account the significant social, cultural, economic, and structural obstacles to human rights enjoyment. They also spell out the main obstacles to the enjoyment of the rights that are the most important to people living in extreme poverty, such as physical integrity, access to justice, an adequate standard of living, adequate food and nutrition, water, housing, health, work, education and social security, and the specific actions that should be taken to overcome those obstacles. If, as you have noted, I lay more emphasis on the need for the elimination of extreme poverty, which as far as the uh, MDGs uh, was expected to be, which as per, sorry, which as per the MDGs was expected to be halved by 2015. So I lay more emphasis on this, on the elimination of extreme poverty than I do on the other MDGs. It is because extreme poverty kills every day. Many of the deaths caused by hunger and malnutrition are not due to food shortage, but are the consequence of poverty and extreme poverty preventing people from accessing supplies. Extreme poverty is also at the root of many deaths caused by easily preventable illness, unsafe practices, and insanitary living conditions. It is equally linked to deaths caused by criminal violence and over-aggressive policing when people are trapped in extremely dangerous sites, unable to relocate to safer areas because of financial constraints. The unnecessary deaths caused by extreme poverty are an unacceptable breach of human rights. The violence of extreme poverty constitutes a massive waste of human resources and potential, causing people to be jettisoned by societies that exploit, stigmatize, discriminate against, and ultimately abandon them. Any future development framework that wishes to be sustainable must address this huge waste of human resources and potential. Sorry, I've shown, I've seen uh, a five minute. I've got some five pages left. <laughs> I don't know whether I stop here or whether I'll, I'll continue. If you think I'll continue, because I have taken a plane, I told you. I have traveled one hour. <laughs> I have traveled, sorry, 12 hours. And you can't expect me to come and speak for 15 minutes. I won't be, do, I won't be doing justice to the subject, but it would be terribly impolite towards my host. They have paid my ticket. Haven't they? <laughs> so you will you will bear with me for my five remaining pages. 
we're coming back to the marginalization of groups on the basis of identity that I referred to at the beginning of my intervention, we feel that the issue of intergroup relations, overcoming divisions and hostilities, and building positive relations must be raised during the discussion leading to the elaboration of, you, of the new set of sustainable development goals. The costs of social divisions and economic and social exclusion are extremely high. This is why in 2007, the Club of Madrid came up with a shared societies project. This project was to provide current leaders and the wider society with greater understanding of the benefits of social inclusion and ways to bring it about. By including and respecting all communities, all religious groups, all ethnic groups, a society will emerge, a society will develop that is at peace with itself and in which everyone feels at home and is able to contribute to the good of the whole society. We called it a shared society because as Mrs. Kumaratunga said, it is one where everybody has a stake and everyone has responsibilities. But such a society does not come of itself. Political will is required since, since that society has to be built, has to be constructed, especially after a conflict or a civil war. And afterwards, it has to be nurtured. Four key elements are essential for a shared society. Mutual respect, equality of opportunity, absence of discrimination, and democratic participation. These principles reflect the values which the high level panel two has placed at the heart of the process of framing the new sustainable development goals. However, those principles are only aspirations and ideals. They need to be embedded in specific policies and practices. To this end, the Club of Madrid has identified 10 policy areas which we have the 10 commitments, uh, not to be confused with the 10 commandments, <laughs> that all societies need to make if they want to avoid social tensions and hostilities and achieve sustainable development. This requires a new approach to governance. And should you be interested, there is a lot more on there is a lot more information on our thinking to be found on the Club of Madrid website. I shall skip one page. So it's one page short. You see, a big challenge that we all face is how to incorporate our agendas into the post-2015 agenda. There are many competing demands. And as I said before, self-interest. Self-interest of the states. I'm not saying self-interest of the presidents or prime ministers. Self-interest will play an important part. So we need to be able to identify a small number of clear and precise steps that will lead to the broader changes that we have identified as necessary. Uh, as I told you, at the Club of Madrid, we've prepared a position paper which lays, which lays out what those steps might be. It has not yet been approved by members of the club, but it should be possible for us to make it available to you. And you are, of course, free to take up any of the ideas in it and use them in your own efforts. It is said that the more people there are saying the same things, the better it is. We have identified four elements that would embed in the new goals the importance of inclusion of all identity groups. They are mutually supportive and will be more effective if they are all included and given due weight in the final sets of goals. First, it is important that the 
data which is collected in the future is disaggregated in terms of the impact of changes on different sections of society, including the ones I mentioned earlier, often excluded. Otherwise, we will have no way of knowing if new development has reached all sections of society. Second, it would be helpful to include references to inclusion of all identity groups within the statement of the targets, the specific targets in many of the goals. Third, we also believe that if one specific goal would be to ensure participation by all sections of society and therefore the goal would be the establishment by government of consultative bodies for each identity group on matters that concern them. And fourth, it is also important to find ways to reduce intergroup tension and hostility. And we would also call for the creation of channels of communication between identity groups and also with government and other sectors of society to develop mutual understanding, prevent conflicts, and facilitate crisis management when conflict arises. Finally, 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 as mentioned already, we not only need to bring a shared society's perspective to national and local governance, but we also need a new global economic system which is more inclusive, accountable, fair, and sustainable. In this, our finite world, the current economic model based on plundering the planet is no longer sustainable. A different world is required, where each and every person can live in dignity and harmony with others and with the environment. Central to this is eradicating, and I come over again on this, cent central to this is eradicating extreme poverty, which as we, have, as we have seen, is a harsh violence inflicted on those who endure it, an unacceptable waste of human resources and a violation of human rights. The world we want must be human rights based, meaning that it must promote all human rights, all rights for all, since human rights are universal, inalienable, and indivisible. It must be concerned about the state of the planet. We should pursue goals that are based on our common humanity. And since no developed country, no developed country, has succeeded in addressing climate change or eradicating extreme poverty, both developed and developing countries must pool their efforts and knowledge in order to fight poverty and climate change together. In our constantly changing societies, the eradication of extreme poverty must take place in conjunction with the fight against inequalities and the <coughs> indispensable transition to a more ecological economy. One of the MDG's main shortcomings has been their focus on questionable, goal, global, on questionable global targets and indicators, and the complete absence of implementation guidelines and accountability mechanisms. Building on this experience, the post-2015 agenda must shift its focus from expected outcomes that seldom occur in time to implementation processes and accountability mechanisms that are consistent with the goals and should be rapidly put in place. Let me end with a voice from the South. I shall quote Professor Rahman Subhan chairman of the Center for Policy Dialogue, Bangladesh. In his conclusion to a paper presented to the SAPRI inaugural conference of New Delhi last year, and entitled Challenging the Injustice of Poverty, Agendas for Inclusive Development in South Asia, Professor Rahman Subhan, while advocating a development process which is less dysfunctional, less unfair, 
and more serviceable to the needs of millions of ordinary people, goes on to say, I'm quoting, that social order where millions of people remain condemned to lives of insecurity, poised on the margins of subsistence, where the quality of their education condemns them to a life of toil, where an episode of ill health could drive their entire family into destitution is not sustainable. This social order is not sustainable. An economic order where millions of young women are condemned to earn $30 a month whilst a handful of people can aspire to a first world lifestyle because such low wages make their enterprises more export competitive is not sustainable. Economic order is not sustainable. A political order where those with wealth can use it to capture and perpetuate themselves in power while those millions who vote them to power have no opportunity to either share this power or to determine how its fruits are consumed is unsustainable. Social power, economic power, and political power. The three are unsustainable. So, is Professor Subhan advocating a paradigm shift? A Mauritian participant at the conference asked his neighbor at conference in New Delhi, is this an, is the professor advocating a paradigm shift? It's a revolution, stupid, was the reply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very thought-provoking presentation. We will now open up the discussion. Let's say 15 minutes. Um, yes. Will you please introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, Hiro, a Japanese economist. Uh, I have one uh, question to uh, Mr. Kasim Utim. Uh, in your presentation, existing economic model is inadequate for eradicating extreme poverty. New economic model is necessary. Uh, I will make presentation, growth is still good for the poor this afternoon. So could you kindly <laughs> <laughs> elaborate your statement, uh, existing economic model is inadequate for attacking the, attacking the eradicating uh, extreme poverty. This is my question request to you. I'd rather come and listen to your <laughs> lecture first <laughs> so and give you the correct answers. Uh, I do not pretend to have the answers, but what I know and what has been lacking, missing so far in all the uh, project that has been devised by several countries to uh, fight poverty, to try and eliminate poverty there is one great absentee, and that is the poor. We have decided for them for too long. I think within the four walls of, a, of an office, it is never, it will never be possible to have a proper anti-poverty program that will eventually eliminate poverty. We have to obtain to have the participation of the poor. It is not an easy, t an easy task because the poor themselves, they have extreme difficulty in expressing their wish, what they want. Those who have had, those who have had access to the poor people know that. But then they are the, the experts. We are not, you and I are not the experts in poverty. They are the experts on poverty. They have, and they are still going living in such dire conditions. 
they have been making and they continue to make a lot of sacrifice. They know what they want and they know what they should have. If you do not listen to them, how are you going? How are we going to find solutions for them? It is with them that we are going to find solutions to fight poverty and it is not going to be fight for the poor. We have to work together for the poor. I don't pretend, as I told you, I don't pretend to have the answers. Each country has its own specificity, although the, 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 the difficulties faced by the, by the poor, especially those, those who are in extreme poverty, are similar, and yet I think different countries can have different solutions to the, uh, uh, to, to the problems of, of poverty. If I may take one minute or less, this leads us to the issue, uh, the, the concept of shared societies where I think you both uh, spoke about this in your presentations, of uh, participation of the marginalized, of the poor, as President Rutim says, though, who are normally left out of plans that are made to alleviate their poverty, to have to perhaps think of um, having institutions, building institutions uh, where all the marginalized groups, at least their representatives, <coughs> will come in at the planning stage, at the review of implementation, uh, progress review uh, of development plans in every country. And I think this is possible because we did try such an experiment and it was very, very helpful and very successful. It lasted only two years because after that I got bombed and I had to personally get involved in it because officials didn't believe much in it and they said, oh, getting people to come and give their opinions is not going to work. And then uh, that uh, sort of was put on a back burner. So I think that is what, if uh, I'm right, uh, President Routine, that that is the kind of thing that uh, we are trying to conceptualize, some institutions, permanent institutions, that will have representation from marginalized groups, uh, together with the government officials and important whoever, relevant uh, people who do the economic planning, development planning normally, uh, and that their voices should be heard and taken into account seriously. Uh, Anila. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start. Is, yeah, I'd like to start with the quotation Priyanti used yesterday in her presentation. Uh, I think it's attributed to Einstein. The significant problems we have created cannot be solved by thinking that created them. Sorry. And uh, what I'd like to raise is it's to do with institutions, to do with governance, to do with the issues we have raised. And I'm happy we have two heads of state because I think we can ask for their experiences. See, in addition to this consumption-driven economic model that we are now recognizing is not sustainable, uh, uh, we uh, also have a problem that the current democratic process is no longer working in the world the way it was envisaged. Because when political candidates who are going to represent the people run political campaigns, it's hugely costly in today's world. So a lot of funds are run these campaigns. And when the candidates come into power, they then owe debts, either in, 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 in financial terms or in kind to those who supported the political process. So then you have a situation where you have the candidates now owing debts to whoever. Then they have to think about coming back to continue the development programs they have started. So then, then you have the political patronage, which is going to ensure that the votes come again the next time. Then you have a situation of the trust, so that I think President Kumar Tumi raised some of these issues, the question of unskilled people being put into positions, because it, the, the political leader will choose the trusted person rather than the skilled person who they're not sure will, will be completely loyal. So you have, then you, you, you have the problem of uh, the competence of the appointments. And in that context, the kind of institutions that President Kumar, I think I know the, uh, the case she's referring to where for two years it worked well and then again, lack of continuity. 
what the president went out and with the new president coming in, that whole good system died. So we have a situation where even the institutions that are set up are very much a function of the political leadership of that period. There is no continuity. So those very institutions that we rely on no longer work the way they did because of politicization. And so the whole, that whole concept, the democratic process, one vote for one person, but the poor who puts his vote there, he then loses control of everything because it's not his money that supported the campaign. So I think we have to not only look at the consumption driven, driven economic growth model, but we also have to look at how the political process, in, I mean, whether it's Barack Obama or the president of Sri Lanka, they are all you know, now in debt to the people who put them into power. So this problem is there. Then there's another aspect. I'm sorry I'm taking so much time, but I think it's relevant to the discussion. Another aspect, again, I think that was raised by one of the speakers. When you look at Asian societies, South Asian societies, the, the culture is that you know the person who came from the village and does well is the one who will find the jobs for his people, uh, you know, for his relatives, who will give the money back to the village for other people to get educated. And now we have brought it to a fine art because the question of nepotism, the president has done well, he came from the village, and then he is now doing, you know, doing, helping out his people, you know, from his village, from his relatives. So this nepotism is also part of the Asian culture. We have to recognize that. So my, and then the West looks and says, oh my God, there's no, you know, they have other rules, you know, there's no question of helping your relatives when you come into power, but in here the culture is the same. So I think some of these practical issues, and I don't mean to be facetious, I mean it seriously, also have to be recognized when we try to change institutional mechanisms to become effective. Institutions, however, uh, you know, the, the concept behind them are not going to work unless we recognize the limitations of how the, the implementation takes place. And I think it's, it's very relevant to this whole issue of governance and how, how, how you are going to lead in the future. Thank you. Um, perhaps I should say one, one word or two on, on, on leadership. Uh, you see, I have just come back from Madagascar. Uh, where observing elections, presidential elections. This is a country uh, which had uh, a coup d'etat some four or five years ago. And uh, after that coup d'etat, the country was not recognized by the international community in particular by the African Union, and uh, mediation had to take place. A former president of Mozambique, uh, former President Shisano, was appointed to be the mediator. And to cut a long story short, finally, it was decided that elections would be held, and uh, we will have a return to a normal, normal situation. In the meantime, five years have elapsed. I was there some six years back, and I went there last week, last month. Uh, yes, last month. The degradation of the society, the number of poor people on the streets, the number of street children, the number of people begging on the streets, the highly insecure situation that even observers under police or army protection felt was simply incredible and you cannot describe it. So unless you have proper leadership, and I agree entirely with you, unless we have proper leadership, good leadership, no country can come out of uh, it's a difficult situation. True leadership is an in essential ingredient. But then you cannot say that democracy has not worked. 
because as somebody said, you know, it is not a good form of government probably, but tell me which is better. Tell, give me another, a better form of, of, of government. If you can find a better form of government democracy, then I'll go for it. Democracy is still the government that is necessary. But the institutions, institutions have to be protected. Protected by the constitution, but means should be devised that they should be protected also by other people. What you are related, relating is not peculiar to, to uh, Asian countries. You know Africa? I am an African. Right? Don't, don't go, as I say, don't go by the look. I am an African. Right? I can tell you that in Africa, there is a lot of, of corruption that goes on. There is a lot of corruption that goes on. Nepotism, despotism, discrimination, uh, doing away with, 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 with an institution once another government comes to power. This is a daily occurrence. But do you think this doesn't happen in Europe? In America? Do you think Europe is immune of all these uh, uh, corruption? Have you heard about the financial crisis? What they did to the banks? What they did to the poor people of some of the European countries? The people, rich people became poor. Poor people became poorer. This is how things go, unfortunately, in, in, this, in this world of ours. Whether it is Europe, whether it is America, whether it is Asia, whether, whether it is Africa, the problems are the same. The problems are problems of the people. Men, men and women. Less women, eh? <laughs> Why? Uh, we were saying yesterday, we, had, we, we were having a very interesting conversation. And we were saying that, um, why is it that few women take part in politics? You have, you have had women prime minister in your country. In my country, there are only two out of 25 ministers who are women. Two out, out of 25. Women don't want to come into politics. And I say this is one of the reasons why our society is as it is. So the more that we have women participating, I believe, the less tendency will it be for the society to become as it has become in your part of the world and in my part of the world. So uh, perhaps one of the solutions of improving uh, democracy is to have parity of representation between women and men so that we have a parliament of 70, of 100 people, we have 50 men and 50 women. We have uh, 25 ministers, we have 13 women and 12 men. Yeah. May I be allowed to respond just for a moment? Yeah. The first thing is I'm well aware about, I, I mentioned both Barack Obama and the presidents of Asia have the same problem. So I was well aware that corruption is not limited to the South Asia, certainly. I think it's global. The second point is I have no quarrel with democracy. It's still the, the, best, uh, the, the best system we have. But what I'm saying is it no longer works the way it was envisaged because the, uh, the process of, of uh, uh, the, uh, the political process of getting the vote is now not working the way it should. So I just wanted to clarify my point. I think uh, there was someone there first. Yeah, yes. yeah Madam, uh, this, uh, yeah, I'm Faisal Samat. I'm a journalist based in Colombo. Uh, this question is to all the panelists and, and you, Madam. It's a follow-up from what uh, Anila said. It's about governance. Uh, Sri Lanka in particular has been facing a lot of criticism on, on its governance structures. Uh, on, on in human rights and so on. And one of the points that came yesterday, I believe, was that uh, should we have a homegrown model of governance with some lessons from the West? Because uh, uh, the point that Anil also made was that, you know, 
the societal obligation, the cultural norms, and so on and so forth. So are we, should we look at a model that has lessons from the West, but is designed to suit local communities, and, uh, and uh, is, is that the best way forward? This was basically what I was trying to say in my presentation, that uh, the, there's going to be more exclusion if we were to adopt agenda, which has been developed uh, to, to, to address problems in a different kind of society, where uh, the Po political, economic, so social conditions are different. So, therefore, there is no question about the need to uh, need to s need, need to uh, uh, identify what our problems are and what what solu what what solutions we could come up with. Uh, just. Uh, uh, in this, in in the discussion so far, we have not got on to looking at uh, the. We we have not got on to looking at how the political process of the political processes of democracy works, but uh, one uh, certainly one can think of good governance uh, in in how uh, the the. The political process, the electoral process, the rep the representational uh, processes take place, and uh, 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 what we lack uh, I in our part of the world uh, uh, an effective counter uh, countervailing subnational system. Uh, there is no getting away that. Uh, uh, all our governments, all our state structures, all our political systems are highly centralized, and the the local voices don't uh, don't come through. And how do we organize that? Would seem to be the 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 the, crit the critical issue, uh, as I see. Uh, uh, we don't have. Uh, we don't have ready-made answers. The literature on decentralization e e is, inc is inconclusive. But that is not to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, that is not the way to go. And, and we, we need to work out modalities. We need to work out uh, uh, institutions uh, that would allow different uh, interests uh, uh, with whether they are parochial sectarian uh, paternalistic uh, to come together I in working out solutions which which I don't which which I think we don't have uh, uh, once again our systems are highly centralized and the 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 representational content, uh, especially at the local level, is virtually minimal. Thank you, Asuka. Uh, there is one question there, and I think we have to end after that. Uh, uh, before that, <coughs> may I just read out some questions that have been sent online after a broadcast on this uh, symposium? Uh, just three questions. The first one says, how can we have a shared society? We don't have secular governance. And I don't know whether the person who sent this means secular only in the religious sense yeah. or secular in every other sense. Uh, secondly, would adopting and implementing a right to information act be a starting point for repositioning development pathways and good governance. I think that's very important. 
Finally, don't developed countries and markets have a vested interest in keeping developing countries poor? That's the eternal debate. <laughs> I'm Avnish Kumar from India, and uh, m the genesis of my question is from the concluding remark of Mr. Qasim and the underlying feature which are emerging. Uh, politics seems to be an enterprise. Uh, with your depth and expanse of understanding and experience, can you suggest a strategy which can convert this enterprise into a social enterprise? <laughs> May I just come in there for a second? In our countries, it has become a very lucrative enterprise. <laughs> I think the same is there in India as well. <laughs> in fact, I, I used to say it is the most uh, is people, some people who come into politics believe that uh, it is the most profitable business with the least amount of qualifications, the least amount of skills, and the least amount of efforts, you make the most amount of money. So. See, I, 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 I wouldn't dare to comment on uh, <laughs> <laughs> what happens in other countries. I have made an exception with uh, Madagascar earlier in my intervention because uh, this was an illegitimate government and the result of four, year, four years of um, rule, indirect army rule meant more poverty in society in uh, But I can, I can speak for my own country. And I think there is a lot to be improved in, 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 in Mauritius to become a real uh, democracy where people will have uh, a say in not only once every five years in the choice of uh, their representatives, but where they can, in the interim period, have, have the possibility of, uh, if not correcting uh, things, at least uh, obtain uh, that the, the leaders become answerable in a certain way. Uh, I don't have the formula, mind you. I don't have the formula, but this has this has to be to be devised. Mm -hmm. I would have, in the context of Mauritius, taken drastic, were I now in power, and the lady would have said, "Well, politicians always." use a different language when they are in or when they are out of politics. Uh, but I would, I would certainly uh, take um, certain decisions regarding accountability and uh, regarding transparency and uh, regarding uh, meritocracy in, in, in my country, in Mauritius. There is a need to do this by uh, new uh, legislations being voted by improvement to the existing constitutions uh, and so on and, and so forth. But I am not in favor of, mind you, I'm not in favor of street democracy. You see what has happened in Egypt when uh, an elected uh, president has been, uh, uh, whether he's taken a right decision or wrong decision, is immaterial that a president has been elected by the people this is an emerging democracy and you have a president elected by the people and as a result of what I call street democracy it has he has been dislodged he's been arrested and he's facing uh, he's facing uh, more than a police case he's facing trial you see I am not proposing to go to that extreme for Mauritius. I don't want to have street democracy, but the existing party democracy should be, uh, should be improved. There are a lot of ways of improving this. Perhaps all the different political parties in, 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 the, in the country concerned, they have to, to, sit down, to sit down and come to an agreement on the type of uh, political system they should have. 
but each country must have its own its own solution to that. I'm not prepared to uh, adv give advice because uh, I've not been able to advise my own country. <laughs> I cannot advise other countries what to do. But there is a need in countries like Mauritius to see again uh, our system of democracy. Would you also include inner party democracy in that? Of course. <laughs> of course. This is the first, I, I forgot that, very important one. Yes, inner democracy. You know, in my country, eh? not in other countries, in my country, uh, <clears throat> you have to Anybody, every individual and every company has to, at the end of the year, submit a return. A return. Either it is to the Mauritius Revenue Authority or it is to the Financial Secretary's Office or whatever. But every person, responsible person who works, who is in charge of family, has to submit a return. Every company has to, and it is left to the, to the, to the people to see if they want to. It, it, it is an open book. Political parties, no. No political party in my country has, is, 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 um, is compelled. obliged, is compelled to submit uh, a return of the year. A party doesn't have to say how much money it has, where it has got the money, from whom he has got the money, what he has done with the money, how he's going to use it in future, nothing. So internal democracy has to be, the, to be, to be uh, resorted to because only the leader decides. I, I, I know in Sri Lanka it is different, but in my country... No, it's not. <laughs> it's exactly my, the same. In my country... <laughs> Within a, a, in a in a party, only the leader decides. All the others, all the others just acquiesce. You see, so absolutely no difference. Here. <laughs> I think we have to conclude now because we are already running a little late. Uh, is that okay? Uh, once again, I would I wish to uh, say how deeply grateful we are to President Kasamu team for accepting our invitation. Uh, please be assured that uh, the last minute invitation was not because uh, we tried anybody else or something <laughs> like that. It was only because uh, SIPA invited SAPRI also uh, rather late in the day. <laughs> and then I spoke to Club of Madrid because they have done a lot of work on this subject and so on and so forth and they took time to say uh, what they would like to do. Uh, and then uh, obviously they uh, identified you, uh, we were very delighted. And thank you once again for accepting to come and for going through all that suffering. Uh, <laughs> even though if you flew directly, probably it would have been three or four hours, uh, but it, that's not to be. Uh, thank you also, uh, Mr. Asoka Gunawardana, for a uh, very erudite presentation of uh, how inclusivity uh, uh, inclusive governance uh, could be brought about institutionally and uh, and also uh, uh, regionally. Uh, and thank you uh, to SIPA for uh, giving us the opportunity, giving SAPRI the opportunity to be part of this uh, very valuable uh, enterprise uh, of uh, making our southern voices heard in uh, the World Fora, which are presently drafting uh, the post-2015 agenda. And thank you, everybody, for participating.